I'm Ian Bremer, president of Eurasia Group and G0 Media. And I'm Brad Smith, vice chair and president of Microsoft. Our global stage series gives you a front row seat at some of the most important gatherings around the world, from Davos to Munich to the UN General Assembly in New York. And we host critical conversations about the biggest challenges the world is facing right now at the intersection of technology, politics, and society. You'll hear from public and private sector leaders and innovators. On topics like cybersecurity, climate change, and ongoing war in Ukraine. Join us for live streams, podcasts, and more throughout the year. Head to g0media.com slash global stage and learn more. Well, hello everyone. Uh, good to talk from Munich, Germany, site of the 2024 Munich Security Conference. I'm Maria Tadeo. And welcome to Protecting Elections in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. This program is part of the Global Stage series presented in partnership between G0 Media and Microsoft. Now in its 60th year, the Munich Security Conference is the largest gathering of its kind, bringing together security and defense policy experts from around the world. But as we know, being in the same place does not necessarily mean being on the same page. Now, high-level conversations are happening here all weekend on a multitude of key issues. The wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, U.S.-China competition, climate change, and of course, technology, specifically artificial intelligence. And our focus today is on the AI and its impact on elections in 2024. Remember, half the world's population is heading to the polls in dozens of elections across the globe. The outcome will impact global policy for decades to come. And these elections are happening for the first time in the age of generative AI. Now, to talk about this, I'm very happy to say I'm joined by Ian Bremer, who is the founder and president of Eurasia Group and G0 Media. I'm also joined by Fiona Hill, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. She's also an author and has incredible uh, foreign policy experience. And I'm also joined by Brad Smith, who is a vice chair and uh, president of Microsoft. And also Ava, last but not least, Maydell, who is a Bulgarian politician, also a member of the European Parliament. I know you're going to be very busy this year coming up. And welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, look, uh, what a great show to be doing this. Uh, today, what what a what a conference, but also the topics on this uh, panel, are, I think, go to a lot of the issues that you've already talked over the past twenty four hours: the elections, uh, distrust, this crisis in democracy, and then this technology that's just moving so fast. So, Ian, the first question to you is: you said, and this I really want to know what you mean. You said twenty twenty four is the Voldemort of election years. That is that is a bad guy, from what I know. Uh, and I think I read the books, but it was many years ago. So remind me, what does that mean, and who is Voldemort, and why is this a Voldemort of election well, years? I mean, Voldemort is the name that should not be spoken uh, <laughs> in the Harry Potter series, which most of us have read at least once or twice. Um, and, and this is the year that people have been very concerned about, mm -hmm. uh, but have kind of hoped that they could push off. Uh, and, and it's not just because there are elections all over the world and trust in institutions is deteriorating. It's also because the most powerful country in the world, and it's not becoming less powerful, is also the most one of the most politically dysfunctional, certainly the most politically dysfunctional of the advanced industrial economies, and it's having election. Of course, I'm talking about the United States. That is a, an election that is maximally distrust-laden. It is one that is, uh, it's really hard to have a free and fair election in the United States that all of its population believes in, believes in legitimacy in. And, and I will tell you, the last 24 hours Munich Security Conference, that is driving a level of concern that borders on panic from American allies all over the world, and especially That's right here in Europe. Word. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very big concern. And Fiona, I see that you, you're nodding. Uh, you have experience on this, of course, the 2016 experience, and you go to 2024. Are you more concerned now? And, and do you agree that there are reasons perhaps to, to panic? I mean, that's a very strong word, but... Well, we don't want panic, meaning that people are paralyzed and then uh, not taking action. So I think, you know, what Ian is saying is the realization has set in that this is really a watershed moment. And there's, you know, some uh, of a trying to get a, a grip, which obviously this kind of discussion is going to help with, about the, the nature of the problem. But then the question is really what to do about it, because, again, panic is not an option, uh, given uh, the, the stakes uh, that are here. And, and you mentioned 2016. I mean, we didn't have a conception at that yeah. point about deep fakes, about the way that AI could be used. We can see it actually being used in many different ways. Look, we've just had an astounding outcome in Pakistan. 
uh, which I, I don't know how much that's been really you know, talked about here on the corners of the Munich Security uh, Conference. But here we had Imran Khan sitting in jail and his team, his party, using essentially a deep fake version of uh, Imran Khan, at least an AI version of him, to still play a role in the election. That because in Pakistan, you know, he, he wasn't able to um, you know, basically compete. And we've just also, against the backdrop of the absolute tragedy of the death of Alexei Navalny. Yes. And, you know, somebody like Alexei Navalny would have actually probably been able, and I don't know whether this is a factor in people like Putin's thinking, but would have been able to use AI in some extraordinary creative way to shake up what, you know, in the case of uh, the Russian election is something of a foregone conclusion. So there are negative aspects of all of this, but there's also the kind of question that we have to grapple with is how when, you know, kind of legitimate competitors or opposition movements that otherwise beleaguered decide to use AI tools, that, you know, that then also has an impact. And so I, I guess, you know, what we're trying to do here is get a, gra a grasp of the entire contours, but also then thinking, how do we address this? What is the right way to be talking about this? And is the ways you know, that we regulate it. And obviously, you know, companies like Microsoft are right in uh, the, th the, the thick of all of this right now. Well, you're in the thick of all of this. So how are you going to respond at, at Microsoft? I know there was an announcement that was made yesterday, but some say tech has to play a much, much bigger role. How are you going to go about this? I think tech does need to play a bigger role. I would start with what is the sort of technology phenomenon we're seeing here. It really starts with the fact that with new tools and products that use generative AI, including from a company like ours, somebody can create a very realistic video, audio, or image. And just think about the different ways it can be used. Somebody can use it and they can make a video of themselves and they can make clear in the video that this is AI generated. And that is one way a political candidate, even one who is in prison, can speak. Uh, or when you saw that, were you shocked? No, I wasn't, because it's clear that that's where it's going. Yeah. And I think the question that people should ask once they separate themselves from just the state of the technology is what is appropriate and what is not? If I want to create a video of myself and I make clear to everyone that this is AI and this is me who has created it, that's one thing. If I create a video of Ian Bremmer saying something that I agree with, but knowing he does not, if I put my words in his mouth, if I put that out in a way that deceives the public as to who is speaking, I think that's also important, but very different. And then let's look about at what we're seeing around the world. The voters in New Hampshire before the New Hampshire primary got phone calls. And when they answered yes. the phone, there was the voice of Joe Biden, AI created, telling people not to vote. He did not authorize that. He did not believe yes. in it. That was a deep fake designed to deceive people. Right. Similarly, there were videos created of Prime Minister Sunak that he did not yes. authorize in the United Kingdom. So that it, what we fundamentally need to start with is help people understand the state of what technology can do and then start to define what's appropriate, what is inappropriate, and how do we manage that difference? And we're going to go into that in more detail uh, later yeah. on in the program. But that phone call, that was stunning. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is happening. You don't have to wait years. I mean, this is happening now. And, right. and uh, are people ready for that, I wonder? You know, is, is even the public aware that this is happening, that this could happen? And, and do they have the tools to respond? I think that's also a big question. It's a hugely important question because arguably the defense of the public is best served when the public itself is prepared, it's educated, and it knows what to look for. Now, if you want to look for hope, look at the recent election in Taiwan. Mm. There were a number of deep fakes, but it appears that none of them had any impact on the public because the public was prepared, because the government had spoken out, it had illustrated how deep fakes could be created and used. And therefore, as people like to say, the public and the country was inoculated against mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. risk. When you go back to where Ian began, say yeah. this election in the United States, or you go to the European parliamentary elections that are upcoming, I think you, the landscape's much more yeah. varied. There are some places where people are more likely to be prepared, they're media savvy. The United States, we're not yet there. 
we're not yet at the election, so we have yeah. time. Yeah. But that's got to be a critical part of what needs to be done. And that's a perfect segue for Eva Medel because the European elections, of course, are, are coming up. The head of the commission said in Davos very clearly that she believed misinformation is a huge threat to a fair and democratic election. Uh, the head of the European Parliament is campaigning already uh, on this. Uh, how concerned are you? I mean, because this is just months away and and it's a huge election. It always is, but this year it feels it will be extra important. Well, I've been working on topics related to technologies for the past uh, 10 years, and I like to refer uh, to the work I do in a tech optimistic way. Uh, but now more than ever, I'm also a tech realist. And I think it's very important to acknowledge a lot of the important developments that AI and emerging tech can bring. Um, it, to support our economic development. But in the same time, especially this year, we need to be very sober about some of those threats uh, that are um, in a way threatening the very fabric of our democratic societies. And this is trust. Um, so the European Union has been preparing through voluntary measures, through concrete legislative proposals. Um, but I have to say that I'm a little bit worried because mm. I think this is just um, one part of of our job. The main part of our job is to be able to confront uh, any time uh, there is a misinformation attack, any time that we feel societies do not have access uh, to uh, information, uh, any time uh, that there is uh, content uh, that is difficult for uh, traditional politicians to address, to actually go out and address it. Um, it's not easy to do it because very often in political parties and conversations, the, 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 the conversations that happen are, well, we'll probably never be as good as those that are trying to uh, deceive society. But you still have to give it a try. And mm -hmm. you need to do it uh, in a very prepared way. And this is why very often I think uh, Europe, in a way, uh, depending on which region, which country mm -hmm. we are talking about, um, you could see there are, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, areas where um, that disinformation uh, has been present for many, many years. Um, and if you only now start to uh, address it, you're perhaps a little bit too late. The seed has grown in, yeah. into a flower now. Yeah. Um, that uh, a society looks at it and most of the time it actually believes uh, in uh, that information. Uh, so I'm worried because we might have have some of the legislative tools, but I think in terms of um, the, the societal mm -hmm. understanding of what is at stake, yeah, okay. it's not there. And it goes beyond Europe, particularly this year. And for us as Europeans, it's important to engage with other democratic nations because uh, we are going to be electing representatives in Europe, but in half of the world as well. And in a year from now, we need to be talking to one another yeah. on very challenging topics. So it's it, we should not just focus on what's happening in Europe, but understand that what's happening here is similarly affecting the rest of the world. And, and can I just ask you very briefly, what's the worst case scenario that you contemplate? And what do you say to people that say, um, you know, ultimately, when you look at someone like uh, Marine Le Pen or her party, uh, she doesn't need AI to be popular. That is her victory now. This is this is uh, perhaps an ideological change that's happened uh, in Europe. How do you go about the two? Because one is not the direct result of misinformation by itself. I, I'm actually, I mean, the first thing I'm worried when we speak about tech and elections in Europe, particularly something that's very simple. I, I do not think uh, in certain areas of Europe, we are going to be able to explain that this video is deep fake. Okay. Citizens today right. and nowadays are unable to distinguish what's true and what's not. And it starts with education. It yeah. starts with the way yeah. media approaches those topics. It starts with the way citizens think, whether it's critical enough or not. Um, and again, uh, we we should have worked on that <laughs> since, you know, a couple of years, but particularly in the past three years. I think Central and Eastern Europe in particular should have woken up to the fact that if now we do not uh, have various inoculation campaigns and so on, um, we are already late, but we are getting late by uh, by the day. And, and so I am worried that uh, for traditional politicians or uh, 
um, um, so to say the center uh, political um, forces will be difficult to explain to society how to distinguish what's what's a truth and not. And now uh, we are going to continue our conversation, but before we do that, I do want to go to a poll because G Zero Media surveyed uh, followers on social media and put a question that read as following. How confident are you in the fairness of elections in your country? And there were four options, very confident, somewhat confident, not confident at all, and unsure. The very confident, the results that we have now is 56% of people said they are, in fact, very confident. Uh, 24 said they're somewhat confident. 17 said, I'm not confident at all. <laughs> and 3% said, I just don't know. I'm unsure. Uh, and when you look at those numbers, what does that say to you? Well, Is 57% acceptable to you? It, Is that it, better than it, you expected? It, it's better than you'd see in the United States, I'll tell you that. Look, I mean, first of all, I, I was asked, I, I thought you'd ask, why is it so high yeah. uh, in this environment, given all the challenges? The reason it's so high is because, one, we didn't ask the Chinese, because they don't have elections. Uh, number two, because India has 1.4, almost 1.5 billion people. Modi is incredibly popular, mm -hmm. and the election process is pretty decent. Also, Indonesia just had elections, and unlike Pakistan that Fiona just talked about, you had 200 million plus people voting in one day. It was perfectly free, it was perfectly fair, and there were virtually no challenges there on the ground. So the big countries, turns out, if they have democratic elections, are actually doing reasonably okay. It is the wealthiest countries in the world where there is a lot of lack of legitimacy of institutions, feeling like they can't believe in their political leaders, um, and there is an orientation towards conspiracy theory. It is a target-rich environment for disinformation. The AI is not creating the problem. The AI is being used by people to manipulate the populations that are already oriented towards not believing in the institutions. That's why the numbers are what the numbers are. And can I ask you, uh, this was based on a poll and you have a lot of followers across social media, but maybe this is unfair because I'm going to ask you just one person, but if we were to take that poll and just focus in the United States, yeah. what are the numbers? What would the numbers look like? Half of that. Yeah. 30% would be very confident, strongly confident, and less than 50% would be confident. Yeah. Do you that, is, that is problematic. Uh, well, hugely. Yes, so, uh, Fiona, do you read those would be the numbers? Well, and and well, how is that acceptable, Brad? Well, we already way? see this in a lot of the polling in the United States as well. I mean, you know, it's maybe not as exact, but all the different polling from many different sources is showing something very similar to what Ian said. I mean, I was actually, you know, quite surprised when I saw that. And then I thought, ah, oh, it's a global survey. Because <laughs> I was wondering, is there a breakdown of countries here? I'd like to know, you know, where is this? This is amazing. You know, who, who did this poll? Uh, and look, there's, two, there's a couple of aspects of this that um, was already talked about, because part of it is kind of a national sets of perceptions. But I mean, what you're really talking about is also local uh, differentiation. In the United States, we've lost local media thousands literally of local media outlets have gone out and uh, out of business and part of the way that people process or receive information is through families and friends and immediate local um, circles and of course you know you get reinforcement of, of these mm. ideas through social media because you're engaging with your social mm. circle now mm. some places i mean people are not on social media so much because you know just of the kind of local conditions but they're still in that uh, same bubble and you've got no alternative trusted sources beyond the kind of national level to counteract the kind of information and you've also got an overlap with a lot of, of areas of you know what in Europe they're calling the geographies of discontent mm -hmm. which is where you've had socio-economic mm -hmm. uh, issues you know the deindustrialization, the regions that are left behind mm -hmm. and those are the areas that are most susceptible as the European mm -hmm. Union has done research and also in the United States to disinformation because people don't have alternative sources and they've lost trust in local officials not just in officials at the national level. And Ian, I'm going to ask you another question because uh, this is a tough question, but I'm going to ask you this question. If that poll, if let's say a CEO of a social media platform, mm -hmm. Elon Musk, were to tweet that poll and that question, what result do you think would come out of next? Mm. Uh, if he asked exactly in that way. The exact way, same question, four options. Yeah, it, it'd be a lot, lot lower. Uh, and again, that's in part because he individually is trafficking an enormous amount of conspiracy theory and mm -hmm. fake news. I mean, I, I think that the it's interesting, the governance of X, as opposed to the governance of Twitter, they are very different. Willingness to deal with, you know, sort of verification of being real people as opposed to pay for play, for example. Um, you know, the, the promotion of individual accounts, both algorithmically as well as 
himself with the most powerful account on that entire social media platform. Look, it's private. It's private sector, but it's also the public square. And we are seeing that that's having a huge impact on democracy. But you nailed the you make a great point there because you say the board may want to do the right thing. They may want to play ball yesterday. They agreed also to this accord that you signed yesterday, Brad. But the CEO obviously sees himself as an individual player, too, with an individual voice. Yeah. So how do you combine the two? Uh, it's, it's going, Can you even do that? Not, not all, I mean, I was talking to some European leaders uh, just this morning who told me that they had a number of policies that they were rolling out and they got a lot of uh, support from a number of tech companies, but not from all. And in this case, Telegram and Twitter X were the two that decided they weren't going to. Uh, one, one model does not fit all. We can talk about global governance uh, and we don't treat China the same way we treat the Europeans or the United States because we think that there are differences in governance values, models, priorities. The same should be true for the way that different companies operate all over the world. That's obviously true. And uh, and Brad, to be fair, just to give more detail on this, uh, we were yesterday participated at an event. You were there with a number of other tech companies. Uh, you signed an accord. Uh, tell us more for everyone that's watching this and maybe did not participate in the event uh, yesterday, did not follow. Explain to us what it is that you've agreed to and how does that feed into the conversation that we've just had? It, I think it may be worth going into It really the connects very itself. directly because this accord has brought together 20 companies from across the tech sector, a very rare event in and of itself. It addresses the problem. You're on it, OpenAI is on it, X is on it. and Meta, Google, Amazon, IBM, IBM, OpenAI, quite a number. It addresses this very specific problem because it is focused on basically deep fakes, you know, audio, video, images that fake or alter, say, a political candidate or a government official or someone else who's involved in an election and then is put out with the goal of deceiving the public. And the accord does three things. First, it brings the tech sector together to work on preserving the authenticity of content. Just like you want to go to the bank and you want to know that the money that you withdraw is genuine, not counterfeit, mm -hmm. it creates the content credentials, the watermarking and the like, so that the content that's generated can be regarded and recognized as genuine and it's harder to circumvent or tamper with. That's number one. Number two, it brings the industry together so that we look and work to detect deep fakes. We create mechanisms so that candidates can report when a deep fake is created about themselves. And then we each publish our policies to address this at Microsoft will remove that kind of deep fake from, say, LinkedIn or our gaming network and our platforms. And third, we'll work together to promote transparency and public education. And this clearly is going to require a lot of work with civil society, with others around the world, to help the public be ready. So it's all about trying to put ourselves in a position not to solve this problem completely. I don't think that's possible. Okay. But to manage this new reality in a way that will make a difference and really serve all of the elections in 65 countries between now and the end of the year. How difficult was it to get a, an agreement around the text? Because not all tech is the same. Well, it turns out that tech companies, have, <laughs> tech companies have lots of lawyers. And yet, whenever you get <laughs> lawyers together from lots of uh, different companies, they bring different views. Um, you always run the risk that every word is perfect, but the sentences end up being incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> but I say, despite all of that, despite enormous hard work and maybe even some frustrating moments for lots of people at good people and good companies, I think what came together is an important step forward. What we just have to remember is it's a step mm -hmm. forward. Many more steps are going to be needed. This is a journey, not just in 2024, but beyond. And uh, as you announced it, Eva also happened uh, to be there. You were also with the commissioner, uh, Jarava, who tackles this. Uh, two, are you happy with the text? Is, is this the best that you could get to? <laughs> is there something that you wish had been there? <laughs> so first of all, I think uh, this is a welcome effort. Mm -hmm. I think is the sort of effort that uh, we have to see uh, happening from now onwards, not just the tech sector coming together, but also inviting civil society uh, and the public sector to be part of the common conversation together. Uh, 20 companies from uh, the tech sector is a lot. Uh, 
I can imagine it was a difficult process. And I also agree it's a first step. Um, and I think the text is good. From my personal perspective, it could be even a little bit sharper. But then maybe you don't get ways? the 20, but then maybe you don't get the 20 companies mm -hmm. on board. And you want to start somewhere mm -hmm. and you want to integrate everyone around the same table. And I would agree with Brad that this is this should be a long-term initiative. Today we are discussing elections. In a couple of months, in, in a year from now, will be another topic where tech and technology will play a key role. Um, and that's the new norm. So we'll need to find a different way to communicate to each other, to agree, to disagree as well, but to find ways forward. Currently, often, when I sit in some of the conversations uh, within policymakers, uh, the conversation is more about we and them. We talk too little about mm -hmm. society where yeah. we all play a role. Right. And I'm glad that companies are understanding that they have a bigger societal role mm -hmm. than currently at least they seem to have been perceiving. And that's a good step. So I welcome it very much. And this is why uh, we've been thinking of how to continue convening this sorts of uh, gathering uh, to bridge the collaboration and the foresight gap. And I'm glad that with Ian and with Brad, we are looking in the same direction of setting up something called the Council on the Future, that would ideally be a convening place. It's not about the rules and regulation. It's more about talking about issues such as the one we are talking today, but having that conversations during the Munich Security Conference 2023 um, mm. and being better prepared. Uh, so it's, it's a great step and we need to uh, see the positives of it. And Emma Medelte, member of the European uh, Parliament, thank you uh, for that. And as we said uh, yesterday, a number of tech companies, including uh, Microsoft, put together and announced this accord here at the Munich Security Conference. Also present in the room, uh, the Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, who spoke to G Zero Media. And let's take a look at what he said. Imagine you're running a campaign. Uh, and suddenly, you know, on Friday um, uh, before the election, it's, you know, blackout period. You can't say or do uh, anything. You know, a, a video, a fake video or a fake audio of you uh, appears, you know, being bribed by someone. What do you do? Uh, how do you react? Um, how do you respond? Uh, how quickly is this um, uh, fake piece um, uh, generated by AI going to go viral? So the fact that we're recognizing that this is actually something that, that can happen, that the tech companies have a responsibility to address it themselves, but that this does not replace the obligation, in our case of our European family, the European Union, to regulate this space, I think is, is an important acknowledgement by, by the tech companies. And I think the more we talk about it, the more we explain to people, even visualizing it, what AI can actually do and how convincing some of these deep fakes can be, the more people, I think, will also understand that if they see something which doesn't really seem to be uh, very logical or very correct, they shouldn't really take the bait. Uh, so as much as it is important to have the technology to protect against um, um, these developments, it's also very important uh, to, uh, to educate uh, the public that uh, they need to be suspicious. And this is something which is actually going to happen. It has already happened in, uh, in elections. In Slovakia, it happened. Uh, it could happen anywhere. And of course, 2024 being a huge electoral year, I think it is important that this is part of the public discourse. And that was the Greek uh, Prime Minister, Kyriakis Mitsotakis, educate the people, he said. And joining us now in the studio is the former president of Estonia, Krista Kalulite. Thank you uh, so much for joining us in this conversation. Yours is a country that has dealt for many years now, uh, not just with uh, cyber attacks, but really uh, misinformation, propaganda. There's a real cyber war uh, going on that started well, years ago, this is not a new phenomenon for you. So what lessons uh, have you learned? And, and is there anything that you can share based on your experience? Yeah, frankly speaking, uh, Eva left, but I would have really wanted to argue the point that Central and Eastern European mm -hmm. nations are somehow more at danger of being uh, falling into the trap of uh, artificial intelligence and all other false news. Mm -hmm. This is certainly not the truth. Most of us actually grew up with newspapers putting out lies daily. It was called Soviet Union. In our case, we were occupied. So we are vaccinated in this sense. Second, I also believe that Estonia in particular, where digital development has gone in this sense differently, that private sector and public sector have done everything together. And we openly share 
the information and the developments what we have. And we collectively regulate also this our digital space. So actually quite well prepared. And that is why I would advocate that working together with companies to understand better this new situation, which new technology is enhancing, I agree. But actually it's not new. Because if you think paper newspapers really lied and lying for a politician was you were dead. I mean, now this is pretty normal. Quality of information since we have internet has kind of gone down with the proliferation mm -hmm. of all kinds of information. You don't need an AI. Politicians are not anymore dead because they're lying. Actually, UK voted itself out of the European Union based on a campaign actually based on lies. So we've seen it before, but it's good that both politicians and the companies and the society as a whole now has a better understanding where this is all leading us. And we are collectively taking actions. As Brad said, this is the first step. Next steps need to follow. And my understanding is that because we are here in the Munich Security Conference discussing for years how to onboard into our security environment technology created in the private sector. You know, in 21st century, things do not happen because government gave you money. This was true for nuclear weapons and internet. It's not anymore the case. So we need to onboard companies also for our legislative process and do it together. Truly Estonian way, I agree. And, and, and that's a great point. In fact, I have a general question that perhaps I would like to put to all of you. Uh, you're talking about this collaboration that is needed. But yesterday, Brad, we talked about this. As soon as an announcement like this is made or an accord like this is made, uh, you're doing it because you believe you're assumed that you want to do the right things. Same thing goes for, for governments. But immediately you see pushback from a certain part of society that will say, here we go. I mean, this is a form of ministry of truth. They're trying to curtail my freedom of expression. Uh, this accord wants me to think in a particular way that I don't like, I don't believe in it. And you immediately see this pushback of a part of society that simply does not believe what you're doing has good intentions. So then what do you do? Well, this is such an important part of the conversation that we need to have around the world. Fundamentally, what is free expression? Mm -hmm. The right to free expression gives me the right to stand up and say what is on my mind. It does not give me the right to call your bank, say that I am you, and ask and authorize for the withdrawal of all of your money so I can spend it before you that even is that. find out. That would be, that's criminal, isn't it's it? It's called fraud. That's not free expression. And just as I do not have the right to steal your money, I do not have the right to steal and use your voice. That your voice belongs to you and you alone. And if I create a deep fake of your voice or a video that appears to be your face speaking words you never uttered, that too is fraud. And as long as we can help people remember that, let's give people the right to say what they think. Let's not steal their voice and put words in their mouth. And just to follow up on this, and a question for you both, um, Ian and Fiona. But it is a reality, however, uh, the head of the commission, just to give you an idea, she went on stage in Davos and said misinformation is something that we care about deeply in the European Union. And immediately the part of that clip that went viral was then changed to say she is becoming the Ministry of Truth of the European Union. They have a secret agenda, the globalists of the world, whatever that means, to tame our freedom of expression. There is I wonder what the percentage of it would be, but there is a significant part of society that simply really believes that you're not going to change their minds. Well, so what do you do then? I, I do think there's a reason why specifically addressing this issue, you needed to have a large number of technology companies mm -hmm. come together and, put, and, and, and take the lead and not the government actors themselves. Because the government actors in power in an election year this is an incredibly challenging thing for them to take the lead on because immediately you would have everyone saying they are doing this to support their own electoral. To rig bid. the election, that yes. These are not fair referees mm -hmm. that are unbiased. They're actually members of a team. Uh, and so we can't allow them to be messing with the way that this election is being conducted and the way that expression is occurring on social media. When you get not one company, not two, but all of them that are agreeing, and the governments are participants, but they're not driving it, I do think that that helps inoculate you, to use Kirsty's term, against some of those challenges. 
What about you, Fiona? It's, it's a very delicate balance. It is, but you've got, look, another challenge as well. I mean, it's, it's one thing to talk about in the Estonian arena where you've managed to get companies and uh, the public uh, sector and the government working together. I mean, we're in a world where, you know, to be frank, there's 7 billion of us, but there's roughly 7 billion, you know, tech giants, individuals um, who are actually shaping uh, not just the tools that we use, but also the forms of discourse. And, um, you know, Brad didn't say this directly, but when you've got the head of one of those major companies, and Ian said it, you know, more directly, who also uses those tools in those public space to promote their own ideas, mm -hmm. you've got a different set of issues. Because I would say from, you know, kind of the, uh, another point, they're also shaping, and particular individuals also shaping the public discourse. And they're putting their finger, in fact, on the scales of how people think about opinions. And that is a really difficult set of issues. So it's not just, you know, European Commission uh, leaders who can be accused to be the Ministry of Truth, who is controlling the public market space, who is participating in that. I will be frank, I do not go on X, precisely because I don't feel that is an open, um, basically, forum. Because I, I don't believe, you know, anymore that that is being, uh, as I say, curated or, or, or I should say, regulated or managed in a way where you can uh, actually be a guarantee that you know your voice is being heard in the way that you want it to be. Not because people are faking your speech, but because there is a promotion of certain amounts of information, which I don't know, you know, what, what is the, um, you know, the point of this? Uh, I'll say on the other side of this, I was uncomfortable that Twitter and then Facebook uh, decided uh, themselves to take Trump, then president, and deplatform him. Um, I, I, not because I thought that was the wrong decision, but because I thought it was kind of an arbitrary decision that was being made in an opaque way by two individual corporations. I, that is not the way that we should think about freedom of speech and expression in society. This, which is a broader group of organizations saying we want to protect against fraud and we want individuals to have rights and we don't want individuals to have those rights taken away. That strikes me as a much more constructive approach. Press, yes, go ahead. I wanted to comment on something which uh, you said, Fiona. You said that in Estonia it's easy because we work hand in hand. Yes, but this only applies for Estonian companies. Right. For small language exactly. groups, it's mm -hmm. a massive problem to communicate with big platforms. Exactly. So mm -hmm. if I'm national here, I would say it's all very horrible. But if I look at it in kind of multilateral <laughs> right. way, then what I'm advocating really in onboarding private sector and companies is that, after all, there are only few, less than 10. Yeah. We normally create multilateral international legal space with more than 190 governments. Adding 10, take, taking them into this discussion as equal exactly. is something which is worth doing. Yep. And it is definitely not impossible. And I think we should do it. I, I agree. I think there's a level of responsibility there that we need to be really talking about here. And, you're already and doing we this. see a level yep, of responsibility exactly. here. And uh, before we move on, however, I do want to run another poll because uh, we've asked a number and they give us a good insight as to uh, perhaps where the zeitgeist uh, is. And one of the questions that we asked, this is a difficult question, what is the state of democracy in the world? Basically, the impressions of the quality of democracy across the world. Four options, again, stronger than in the past, similar to the past, weaker than in the past, and in jeopardy. And the results, uh, I wonder what you think, 5% said it is stronger than in the past, similar to the past, that was 10%, it means flat, basically, weaker than in the past, 52%, so it means mm -hmm. we're worse off now, and in jeopardy, that is in serious danger, 33% percent of respondents said they believe democracy is uh, in danger. What do you make of results like this, Brad? I think there's two things that are worth keeping in mind. First, I'm reminded by a New York Times story that said that technology was now spreading information at a rate that is faster than the speed of truth. Mm -hmm. That was written in 1860. Yeah. And it was right. It was the telegraph. It was spreading information across, at that point, the United States faster than people could actually discern whether something that they were hearing about and was being reported was accurate. What it really means, in my view, is that the last answer is always right. Democracy is always in jeopardy. Mm. Every generation has to answer the call to defend it. Yeah. And for 200 years, since really the printing press enabled mass printing of newspapers, 
technology is always creating these new challenges, even threats to some degree to democracy, whether it was the radio or television or the fax machine or the internet. It's always a tool to spread accurate information. And unfortunately, it is often weaponized Mm -hmm. in ways that create these new threats. So what does that mean? Now it's our turn. It's our turn as a generation of people to say that technology always changes, but democracy is a value that we hold timeless. So let's do what it takes to defend it, to preserve and promote it. That's what we're doing here in Munich this weekend. It's what we're going to need to do in 2024. When Ava said that she has founded a council of the future, that's never going to go out of business. (laughs) Every year we're going to have to get together and figure out what new things we need to do. And and let me ask you just a a follow-up question on this. It's maybe a a cheeky one, but can you do that on on a voluntary basis? Because the accord that you've signed is, if I understand it correctly, doesn't really impose anything. This is on a voluntary basis. Do you protect and help democracy on a voluntary basis? You definitely help. I think you need three layers of protection. And I think voluntary efforts are always critical. And maybe they're a starting point because that's where you can do things new and fast and experiment and learn. But then I think second, ultimately, the rule of law itself is the fundamental Mm -hmm. foundation for our democracies. And so we'll learn where new laws are needed. Just like with money, you can't counterfeit it. With content, you can't take away the protection, and fake it. But then the third is with the public. You know, a well-educated public that believes in democracy, that is the ultimate defense. And then you need to bring the three of these things together. And maybe what we should be the most worried about today is whether in some societies, including the United States, people are losing sight Mm -hmm. of their common bonds. Mm -hmm. They're Mm -hmm. spending so much time oftentimes talking about what sets them apart, what makes them different from their neighbor or others, that they're forgetting that we all do share this common interest in being able to speak our minds, in being able to pursue, say, whatever kind of job or interest that we have. We have to remind people of that. If we don't remind people of that, if we don't bring that into the conversation, who will? Yeah. And on that, I, I want to ask a, a final question. Uh, and you mentioned this democracy, stronger democracy. Is that still possible? Is it something you can still salvage? Because, uh, of course, this meeting security conference is happening in the context of the death of Navalny. That was yeah. uh, clear yesterday. Uh, his wife on stage uh, with almost tears in her eyes, but really saying there cannot be impunity. But it seems... On the surface at this point, Vladimir Putin is going on about life as if nothing was happening. And, and it seems that on that front, well, impunity is, is the word of the day. So can you still make this a stronger democracy? Is there still a, a, a case uh, for it, Ian? Look, Brad's talking about history and that we've been through this before. Um, we, we should remember that the Americans weren't going to join World War II until Pearl Harbor. Um, and uh, Europe would look very different today if that hadn't happened. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's continual work, but this is a fragile project, and it can break. Uh, and and we, we need to understand uh, that it can happen here, uh, that what we're talking about right now, the response to the impunity of Putin, Munich Security Conference starts, and, you know, he sends a very clear message, mm-hmm. this guy is dead. And I don't care. It's deliberate. It's deliberate. I don't care. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm going to act and and you can't do anything. And and I'm going to outlast you because this Mm -hmm. matters Mm -hmm. more to me than it does to you. Well, I I can tell you, I don't think it matters more to Putin than it does to those of us on this panel today. I don't think it does. And and I I, what I've seen at the Munich Security Conference, there are a lot of people that are prepared to stand up to people like Putin, rogues and thugs and people that want to destroy our democracy. But we cannot pretend that that is just a matter of the election. It happens every day. It happens with all of us, with our loved ones, our families, our communities. It happens in our jobs. It happens at home. It happens all the time. And that's, that, that is going to be effort. You don't sleep on this. He's not sleeping. Mm-hmm. I saw President Zelensky this morning says that, you know, uh, dictators don't take vacations. Well, I mean, democracies don't take vacations. OK, and if you pretend that you can take a vacation as democracy, that's why only five pe- percent of the people are going to have confidence mm-hmm. uh, in the future. We've got to get that number up. And the way we get that number up is hard work. 
And uh, President Zelensky got here, I believe, at 1.30 in the morning. He was up early today, so certainly he's not been on vacation for the past few years. Uh, Fiona, President, just a quick word uh, on this. Uh, look, as Ian said, it seems that impunity in, in that respect, it's, it's, it's going to loom large, and, and, and yeah, I mean, it's a risk for the democratic world. Yes, but I would like to draw your attention on some other risks. Mm -hmm. I mean, democracies indeed are always voluntary. You always have to go and vote yep. and sustain our democracies. And every nation finally has the right to ruin their country mm -hmm. as well. Yep. We've mm -hmm. seen countries, I mean, give up on democratic path. Some have gone some way, mm -hmm. then turned back. And very often when they manage to turn back, it is because there is some extent of the free media remaining in mm -hmm. the country. Right. Right. And uh, according to the last index, there was around 10 countries in this world who have totally free media. Very few. <coughs> I come from, from one of those countries, but we also have politicians calling for that. I mean, out for media for asking wrong questions and, you know, right. difficult times, <coughs> and you should actually quell and give us time to, I mean, sort this reform and so on. This is an unseemly thing. You shouldn't be doing it. This is also defending democracy, is supporting your free media. And at every new tech level, Finally, what I wanted to say is that you have to remain a compassionate human being. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what you need to do at every tech level. And we really need to help this new generation who doesn't instinctively learn emotional skills, mm -hmm. but learns right. instinctively technology skills to really remain these human beings to sustain our competitive advantage. Yeah. And Fiona, final word. Yeah, I think this is spot on. And I'd just like to um, reiterate what Brad said about trying to emphasize what we have in common. And I think, you know, the, there is a responsibility here and the president has, you know, said the same thing. And that does also get back to the local level. And I'd like to see, you know, a lot more of, um, you know, the, the big tech companies trying to support local media. I mean, you can do it on your platforms, of course, uh, but, but also giving, you know, kind of people more of a sense that they're participating in this at the local level as well, rather than, in, in the, as you were saying, these impersonal, mm -hmm. you know, levels where, you know, these are the, um, uh, the arenas where you actually can get out on the street and see the people face to face that you're also communicating with. Uh, through social media, but more emphasis on what we have in common rather than what is pulling us apart, even if it might be actually more beneficial for the bottom line, you know, to be emphasizing division because, you know, the, the algorithms play to that. But I think, you know, what you said was spot on and, and the same with the president. Well, on that note, uh, we've reached the end of the session, but I want to thank uh, the four of you for your time and, and your insights. I know the conference uh, continues and everyone's very busy, but I wanted to uh, thank all of you and, of course, everyone that's uh, watching. And I'm sure there's been many of you. And also a reminder uh, you, that you can follow the coverage, but also the rest of the Global Stage series by going to g0media.slash Global Stage uh, for everyone here in the studio, but also joining us uh, online. I want to say bye from Munich. I'm right there. I have been your moderator. It was a pleasure. And I wish you all a great day. And thank you to all of you again. Thank you very much.